virus, Lord, have just been running rampant as well. So we ask for those of our friends and those that we know who have been challenged with things that are other than the virus, virus that has gone around, that God, we would just, they would hold fast to you. And that they would know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are with them. We know that some among us have gone through times of our soul, of all that we are. God, I pray today that those who are distressed by the situation that they might be faced with, that you would show them that under the hand of the Almighty God, that you're a refuge, that you, we are in your shadow. And when we're in your shadow, Lord, you protect us, you lead us, you guide us, you're there for us. And so this morning, we just ask, Lord, that any who are sensing that distress this morning, the anxiety, that, Lord, it would be lifted, and that you would be known as the one who came in and who rescued their soul this morning. We thank you for your everlasting love that surrounds us. We thank you that we have you to trust in, Lord. Without you, we know that we are nothing, but with you, all things are possible. Amen. And that Amen. doesn't matter if it's a physical need, if it's a spiritual need, if it's an emotional need. God, we know that when our hand is in yours, that we can trust that you are overseeing every part of every operation of us. And so we give you thanks for that today. We also ask, Lord, that as we turn our eyes to your word, that you will speak to us. We need to hear from you, Lord. We need to know what our part is in the body of Christ, the part that you designed us to be. And so we look, for, we look to you, Lord, this morning, and we ask that you will guide us and that you will be the spokesperson and I will just be, that you will speak and I will just be Lord, I pray that we will hear from your word exactly what you want us to hear. That I will not add in or take away anything that you want us to hear, but it will be your words that penetrate our hearts and that cause us to move beyond where we are to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ in our place where we live. And Lord, we will forever be grateful to you for the word that you have given us, for the way that you operate in our lives, and that we will follow hard after you, being your disciple and building your body, the body of Christ. And we will give you all the glory and praise for what you do. And it's in your name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad that he's a healer today? And he's yeah. the one that we turn to for every need that we have. Doesn't matter where we are, how far you are away from him, how close you are to him, he hears you. And I want you to know that this morning. Well, if you showed up today thinking that it was going to be a Mother's Day and I was going to preach to mothers, I am not. Because uh, to me, that is a secular holiday. And uh, I want to be faithful to what the Lord has shared with me to share with you. And so we're going to be talking about bodybuilding. So... When you hear those words, what do you think about? Gym. You know, you're, the gym. Oh, we think about workouts, right? We have to actually be fit or do something. Maybe you think about fitness plans. Maybe you think about supplements that you have to take or competitions or conditioning or the lifting weights, um, building your muscles, uh, strength training. Maybe you think about good food that you need to eat, the nutrition. Maybe it's power training. Um, maybe it's your health. Maybe you think about injuries and how sore you are after. Or maybe you're considering the resistance training that you go through when you build your body. Um, maybe it's that you need rest, because we need that as well. Um, maybe you think that you're overtraining. Maybe the couch potatoes think that. That's what I think sometimes. I don't want to overdo it, you know. Um, and adequate sleep. All of these things pertain to building the body, the physical body. And it's necessary for 
our body to be built up. But Jesus said, through Paul, that we need to be built up in the body of Christ. And so, um, maybe some of you thought when I said bodybuilding about people. You know, I had to look this up because I didn't know this stuff. But Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was 20 years old, was called Mr. Universe. Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk, built his body up so he could play some as an actor. Um, so what does all this have to do with us being the church? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, as believers, we are called the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has to do body building in order for us to be effective, efficient, and what God has called and designed us to do as his people. Amen. And so we are in the business of bodybuilding for the purpose of the kingdom. That's why we're here. Amen. The, body, the body of Christ is important to the world and where we live. When the body of Christ, I want you to get this, when the body of Christ is flexing, everybody flex your muscles now, it's spiritual muscles, in all ways, it becomes a church that transforms its community, that's not the church, inside the walls, it's outside the walls, and so we're transforming the community outside and expanding our capacity for ministry and service. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to read that one more time. Because that's important to our understanding of the scripture we're about to read. When the body of Christ is flexing its spiritual muscles in all ways, not just in one, not two, but all ways, it becomes a church body. See, it's not got nothing to do with the building that transforms its community and expands its capacity for ministry and service. Amen. Amen. Last week we talked about being the salt and light um, in our communities, in our church, in our families, in our workplaces, um, everywhere that we go in the entire, our entire society. So it doesn't matter where you are, what kind of work you do, we are influencing or impacting the world for Christ. Hopefully it's for Christ. We are for the salt and light. And we're the hands and the feet and the voice of God in our world. We speak for him. What do we say? What does the world hear us talk? How do they hear us talk? What do they hear us say? And so the, we find that the church, the, the body of Christ, really exists so that we can equip and train Disciples. Do you know what a disciple is? Um, I, I was amazed. I was shocked actually when I was reading something online a few years ago about um, Oprah Winfrey of all people. Um, she has some good things. I'm not knocking her, but she said she had over one million disciples, and I thought that called that disciples. What? Well, then Jesus has disciples, right? But Paul said he had disciples. The, the, the apostles said they had disciples. And so John, the Baptist who baptized Jesus, said he had disciples. So I, I started thinking, I thought, yeah, maybe they're, she's right. But what are they following? You see, the followers of Jesus follow the word. We're not following just the writings or the sayings of some person who professes to be a leader. We're following what Jesus says. And so a disciple of Jesus, that's what we're going to talk about today, not anybody else. Where a disciple of Jesus learns about and from him. We learn about him and we learn from him so that we can then disciple others. We're students or learners or followers of his. We're witnesses for him. By word and deed. Talked about that last week, right? It's not just the word, but we have to put the deeds in place as well. Because that helps people understand this is who God is. He empowers us to do this work. And so we want to look at Saul, who became Paul, before his conversion. 
conversion experience, he was a murderer. He was a front runner in persecuting Christians in the early church. So turn with me to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, that's Christ's way, capital W, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So, so Saul wants to bind these people and bring them to Jerusalem. Why? So that they can be arrested. So that they can be further persecuted for what? The cause of Christ. Is this happening in our world today? Absolutely in places. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And look at his response. He asked, who are you, Lord? He recognized the voice of Jesus even though he was a persecutor of Christians. Because that's how Jesus' voice gets heard. The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and didn't eat or drink. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. Do you answer, here I am, when he speaks? The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision, in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your said to him, go. Are you ready for this? This is how the Lord is going to use Saul, who becomes Paul. He is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself, Jesus, will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And we wonder why Paul suffered. Maybe it's because of the suffering he caused to believers. And Jesus is now is not paying back. Don't get it like that. But God has a way of helping us to understand who he is through our suffering. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it takes that in order for us to understand who he truly is. And so Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, regained his strength. And for several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. We need to understand this because this helps us to, to this helps to put the backdrop in place for what Paul's training and his next steps were going to be. So he is now going to move into talking to who? He's going to talk to kings, people in authority. He's going to talk to um, both Jews and Gentiles. He wrote much of the New Testament. And so here we are looking at this man that was mightily used of God who first started out persecuting the very people that he began witnessing and training. Amazing, isn't it? How God uses people where he calls us where we are, picks us up, and
And then he puts people in our path to come around us and train us and help us to understand who he is. Because Paul spent a lot of time with the apostles learning from them before he was sent out. Amen. And so he had, he called Timothy. He, he found Timothy. And he's training the next generation. Do you hear this, church? We must train the next generation. Amen. It can't just be those of us who have been in place for a long time, and they may not do things the same way we do, and we must be okay with that. Can you hear that? No. <laughs> Strong preaching. I'm glad I didn't have any here today. And nobody brought it up, right? It's okay. It's from the Lord. We have to. Why? This is a very example that Paul showed us, and he's given it to us so that we have the training that we need to pass on to others. Amen. But what I want you to really take away from this today, all through what we're going to be reading, is the impact that Paul had on the young life of Timothy. And the impact that it meant for the world. And the impact that it means for you and I. And so I want you to hang on that word. Write that word down somewhere. Impact. Because that's what Tiffin Church of the Nazarene is about to do. We are about to go and impact our community for Christ. Amen. To build the body of Christ. To build the kingdom of God. Amen. Not to build a local church. Amen. That may be a byproduct of what God brings to us. But the, the, the thing that we're called to do as disciples of Jesus Christ is to build the kingdom. It says to seek the kingdom of God. Amen. Not to seek the kingdom of yourself. And so let's look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but wicked people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, so what Paul's telling Timothy, Continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it and how from your childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Amen. In Ephesians 4, the gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to what? Equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says, Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another. Serving, giving away, whatever gift you, each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. First mm -hmm. Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates all of them in every. And Paul goes on in that passage of scripture to list more of the gifts. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we 
are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So how do these passages all come together to relate to bodybuilding? First one we see is that Timothy, or Paul takes on Timothy, and he's taken him under his wings as his spiritual son. Paul, we, we have observed through scripture that we do not believe that he was married. Um, and so Timothy has become his son, like as, as a um, child that he has taken into under his wings to train and teach and disciple. And so the first thing that we read is in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, he says to Timothy, Observe. You've already observed these things. You've observed my teaching. You've observed my conduct. You've observed my aim in life for my purpose. You've observed my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering. You've observed all these things, Timothy. And so when we disciple others, we have to know they're learning from us. They're not just learning the words that we say. They're watching the very lives that we live. And they're looking to see, how do they handle these situations? How does that person handle when life gets tough? When you go through difficult things? When you have the challenges beyond what you think you can bear? How do they bear up, actually, under these things? Let me watch and see. That's what Paul said to Timothy. You've already seen me go through these things. You know and saw what happened when I was shipwrecked. In other words, you know the persecutions that I endured and am enduring. And so Timothy learned a lot just by watching and observing Paul. People are watching your lives whether you believe it or not. They're watching to see what you do. They want to know, how can they handle this crisis? What are you doing in this crisis? That's the questions some people are asking. I've been asked that multiple times. How are you handling this? Well, my God is really handling it. That's my answer. Because I don't need to work, live in fear. I might take precautions, but I'm not going to live in fear. Amen. I'm going to walk with him. Because he is going to guide me. He gives me wisdom. He says that in his word. And all I have to do is pray and ask him, Lord, is this the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. I need your wisdom. Amen. And he guides me. And so we, people are watching. The things that Timothy learned that, that come from these are faith, patience, love, and steadfastness. He didn't just watch the sufferings, but he learned the emotional side of Paul. He learned what he was going through at that deeper level. And so he was looking at the spiritual and emotional responses, his reactions to life in general. How do we react? Do we react with grace? Do we react in peace? Or do we have to react in a frenzy? My scripture tells me that my God is able to supply every need that I have. And I think sometimes we think it's only the physical, tangible things that we can touch. But I know that it's beyond that. Amen. Amen. It's beyond what I can touch because he touches my spirit as well. He's given me words from his word that have been a comfort to me, that have surrounded me with peace, that have carried me through difficult times. It's his word that is enough. You see? Mm -hmm. And so when I stand on his word, I know that he supplies all of my needs. Amen. Amen. Timothy, watch that persecution and suffering. And I can imagine, if you've ever watched someone suffer, you may wonder, God, what are you doing? Like, do they really have to suffer this hard? I thought that when I watched people. And then God reminds me of this passage. It's in this. It's during this time. I'm still at work. I still have them in the palm of my hand. Amen. Amen. Timothy also learned from the instruction from the word of God. Mm -hmm. We find this, Paul saying, continue, keep going. 
going, Timothy. Keep walking in all that you learned. Who did he learn it from? He learned that what did he learn was the sacred writings. Who did he learn it from? His childhood. He had a mother and a grandmother of faith. And her name happened to be Lois, the grandmother. And I'm proud of that. <laughs> Just saying. <coughs> challenge you. 
to live in this way yourself. We're all a part of the bodybuilding business. And you know what? Multiplication. So if I, if I disciple 10, and each one of those 10 disciple 10, how, much, how many do we have now? 100. And each, each one of them disciple 10. Now we have 1,000. And it multiplies, which is much greater than addition. And so if I only do one person and add one person, it's not as effective, is it? And if they only add one, it takes a long time to get to 1,000 that way. But when we multiply, when we make more, that's what counts. And so we need to be multiplying ourselves. As we learn, we need to teach others what we learn. What I learned when I was teaching school is when I told the kids, you go home and teach your parents what you learned today in school, they learned even more because they sealed it to their mind. Mm -hmm. And so we learn not just to take in information, but we learn so we can exercise our spiritual muscles and we can grow by sharing it with others. Because when I give it away, when I teach, when I train, I learn. I learn when I prepare the messages. I have to study. I have to know. What did you want me to share, God, from this? You see, so I'm, I'm exercising my muscles, too. Don't think I'm not. Every week I have to exercise. Even more. As I see the day approaching. The fourth thing we see is that this is for building the body of Christ. Paul points out that there's different members. And from a personal perspective, from when I look at just myself, I see that I have many members of my own body, as Paul pointed out. I have ears, I have eyes, I have you know, mouth, I have hands, I have feet. And so all of these members have a particular job that they do. And you let one member get hurt out of all that. Yesterday I did something to to a hangnail in my thumb, and I mean, it was throbbing all the way to the first joint. And I said, what is this? Like, this is ridiculous that that should hurt so much, that it affects, like, what I can touch and what I can pick up. But that's the way it is, you see, personally. And so there's scripture that Paul shares with us that even when one part is hurting, we all hurt. When one pot part is being built up, we all get to be built up. Amen. That's the body of Christ, using our gifts the way that he intended for us to use them. When we look at this from a community perspective, then we see how inside the church we use our giftedness so that we can build the family right here in this one church. But when we look at it from a global perspective, which is where we want to look always, we have to see individually, we need to see how the community comes together, yes. But we have to get beyond that and go global. And so when I look out globally and I see the view from outside and what it does when I use my gift in the world, God multiplies that exponentially. It's not even controlled. And so we have individual perspective. We have community perspective. But we should always keep the kingdom perspective before us. Amen. Never lose sight of the kingdom of God. Amen. There's variety, Paul said. I love that. My mom told me when I was little, well, she, I think she said it when I was older because I remember it, that if there was, if I was a cookie cutter mold, she would throw the world blow away, right? Yeah, I don't blame her. Who would want more than one of more than one of me? Couldn't me, I don't think the world could handle it, right? Because that's what my husband used to tell me. The world couldn't handle more than one of you. That's why God created only you to be who you are. But you know what? We struggle sometimes with who we are, right? But God created the very being that we are. He said, I knit you together while you were in your mother's womb. He took us and molded us into what he wanted us to be. He created us with our own personal DNA, noticed by the world from our thumbprint Amen. or our face, where we use our face now to open phones and things, right? <laughs> it's amazing that God created us. I look, my daughter and I look very similar, and so I even tried opening her phone with my face and we couldn't do it. How about that? Like even my own children have their own personal identity. I love that. But it says that God loves variety. He has to, but he created all of us different. And he's given each of us different gifts. But 
what he say? Who activates it? He does. He activates it in each one of us. He activates the gift, he activates the service, and he activates the activities. He brings it all together so that you and I can go and serve the kingdom of God. So he gave us gifts, but the bottom line is that he gave us a gift to serve him. That's how we show him that we love him. That's how we demonstrate how much we, we love one another even. Because when we use those gifts in his service for him, who's glorified? Not us. And we better not be taking the glory. Because it belongs to him. He's the one who put it within us. He's Amen. the one who activated it. He's the one who put us in service for him. And so we give him praise and glory because it's all about Jesus Amen. and what he does. Amen. And so this is what Paul ends with. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Isn't that beautiful? God activated it. God placed it. Now go use it to serve one another. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. It's not us. Why? So that God gets the glory. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. So we don't even do it in our own strength. The bodybuilding is to get our minds built and our bodies built in such a way that we can serve him. And we can do it in a glorious way according to the grace that he gives us and has given us. And then we give it back to him as he activates it in us. Amen. What a beautiful thing that he strengthens us. And so we serve as uniquely different as we all are. And he didn't put the gift in you to be self-serving. He put it in you to share. It's all about sharing. It's all about helping the body of Christ to be built up. And that's what we're about. And so to build the body, we have to preserve our uniqueness. We have to value our uniqueness. But we also have to value our uniqueness in each other. And so I want you today, if you're watching online, look at the person next to you if you have someone there. If not, remember this and go tell someone. I celebrate your uniqueness. I celebrate the way God made you. I celebrate the way he made you to serve in your family, in your church, in the world, in his kingdom. And I celebrate that you are you and that I am me. Yet we can be of the same body of Christ. Get that? You are you, I'm me, but we're the same body of Christ coming together and allowing God to activate all that he's put within us to then turn around and give it out again. Amen. The time is now. The time has come to go and impact the world for Christ. We can start today. Many things are opening up here in Ohio and probably wherever you're listening into. So God is activating in us what he wants us to do. People have been locked up for a long time. They need to hear the hope of Jesus. We have the best message for them. Let's go share it. If you don't know what your gift is, I would encourage you to reach out to me. I can help you find out your, what your gift is and what God has given you. But some, some of you probably already know because it comes from the passion of our heart, what he wants us to do. And so he impassions us with what he wants of us to, how he wants us to serve others. And so I want to just encourage you today to go and serve. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the word. We thank you that you called Paul out and that you made him one of your disciples, one of your followers that heard your heart, heard your voice, that saw you work in his own life. He experienced what happened to him. 
He experienced the call on his life and used him to this very day to help us understand our place in this world is to serve you with all that you've given to us, with all that you activate in us. And so today I pray that as we go and exercise our spiritual muscles, that God, you will go before us and help us to build the body of Christ in our world. And we ask these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 That's great.